So, welcome to the instruction course from Chartered on visual electrophysiology. Most poorly understood, visual electrophysiology has gained its popularity across quantum legal computer applications. Electrophysiology is being used for confirmation and prognostication of many more serious diseases. Unfortunately, many institutions have only weekly buses. They don't have full ERP, EOG, and weekly buses. So, uh, then it is confined to only few places. And this is the reason people shy away from this electrophysiology uh, diagnostics because they find it very boring. And once our instruction course is over, you will, uh, uh, once uh, we start this instruction course, we will talk step by step. Uh, welcome. We will talk step by step on electrophysiology, knowing the machine and introduction of the, uh, the electrophysiology. And uh, then we will also guide to implement them in the routine practice. At the end of the IC, you will be able to read the report, correlate, and also can start your own electrophysiology testing. So today, we have two star guest faculties with us, Dr. Purna Chandra and Dr. Parveen Ma'am. Dr. Parveen Ma'am will be talking on the pattern ERG and uh, multifocal ERG, Dr. Purna will be talking on full field e ERG, um, uh, Dr. Vibhuti Bhushan will talk on introduction of visual electrophysiology, Dr. Raji Raju Rahul Prashad will talk knowing the machine and Dr. Bharti Kashyap myself will talk on tips on EOG and Dr. Nidhi Rajendra Gadkar will talk on BEP. So first I would like you to introduce our guest faculties. And the light is very dim. Can you put on the light? Put on the light. So, uh, Dr. Parveen Singh is the senior consultant and in charge of Retina Clinic, Dr. Agarwal Eye Hospital, Chandigarh. She was former senior consultant, Vito Retina Services, Shankar Nidali, Chennai, Tamil Nadu. And Dr. Parveen Singh has been a senior consultant and Vito Retina surgeon at the Shankar Nidali for last 23 years. And uh, for the 23 years, she has the experience of doing complex vitreo retinal surgeries, including retinal detachment, diaptic retinopathy, eye trauma. In addition of doing all these surgeries in adults, she is a renowned pediatric retina surgeon as well and has won laurels across the country for pediatric retina surgery, especially surgery for retinopathy of prematurity. And she has Area of interest are medical retina, including age-related macular degeneration, adaptic retinopathy, retinal imaging. She is an expert, a great expert in electrophysiology and has been in charge of electrophysiology clinic only in Shankar Nidhala for more than 20 years. We are privileged to have you, madam, as our guest faculty. Our another guest speaker, star guest speaker, is Dr. Purna Chandra B. He is uh, the Vito Retina Consultant. Uh, and he's the uh, senior person in Department of Electrophysiology uh, in Narayana Nitrale. Dr. Purna has completed post-graduation from prestigious Armed Force Medical Colleges, long-term fellowship in Vitro Retina from Narayana Nitrale, underwent additional training in inherited retinal diseases and electrophysiology from Moorfields. He has completed perceptorship on age-related eye diseases from Safe Sight Institute, Sydney. He has presented several papers on national and international forums and has published many articles in peer-reviewed journal. He has won several awards, including the Retina, uh, uh, Rima, uh, uh, Rema Mohan Award for Best Paper Retina at AIOS and Best of IGO Awards. So the area of interest is again electrophysiology, inherited retinal diseases. So we are privileged to have you in this instruction course from Jharkhand. So uh, now I, I am uh, introducing Dr. Vidhuti Bhushan. He is the director of the Vishnu Nitrale. He has, he's a VR surgeon trained in Shankara Nitrale. Dr. Vibhuti, please say hi to everyone. And uh, Dr. Rahul Prashad, he is the associate professor in uh, RIMS, Raji, the largest uh, medical college of uh, Charkhand. And he's also a retina person. And uh, Dr. Nidhi Gadkar Kashyap, 
she is a senior, uh, director uh, uh, director of kashyap memorial eye hospital she is a prolific cornea surgeon but she has interest in electrophysiology in diagnostics and i am myself dr bharti kashyap i am a cataract refractive surgeon but i am a medical retina person too so uh, the chief instructor of this course is dr bp kashyap who started the electrophysiology uh, a very uh, different kind of rare department of retinal diagnostic in jharkhand in the year 2018 but because of sub uh, medical emergency he could not uh, participate so let us start and uh, first i invite uh, dr vibhuti bhushan he will be talking on introduction of visual electrophysiology 10 minutes then dr rahul prashad then i will invite madam the talk is only 10 minutes so please vibhuti bhushan welcome Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Ten minutes. First of all, uh, I thank the AIUS for giving us this opportunity to have this instruction course, and uh, I'll be just introducing the electrophysiology so that uh, the subsequent speakers can uh, talk about more specific things. so uh, we have different uh, investigative procedures that we do in direct ophthalmoscopy 90d ocd ffa visual fields but electrophysiology gives us uh, early and specific uh, informations why uh, we need electrophysiology test it is to localize the problem in the visual pathway symptoms history family history and clinical examinations has its limitations the night blindness may have many other causes apart from retinitis pigmentosa retina may look absolutely normal but may have no vision retinal pigment abnormality may not match the loss of vision so who are the candidates who need to be put uh, for uh, these electrophysiological tests the symptoms suggestive of known neurological or ophthalmological disease which require confirmation of the diagnosis like retinitis pigmentosa best disease multiple sclerosis etc if there is an unexplained visual loss so what i have planned in the medical legal problems and defects associated with psychiatric disturbances or mental and physical handicap in pediatric neuroophthalmic practice it's really very helpful where medical where, where media opacities prevent other clinical exam examinations like cataract corneal opacity vitreous bleed etc it's very helpful to monitor the health in case of drug toxicity like hcq ethambutol etc uh, detection of disease or carrier state of inherited visual disorders also uh, can be done in cases of like uh, rp and cone dystrophy it provides a quantitative assessment of the progress of an eye disease and in assessment of retinal and optic nerve function following trauma so what are the patients who need who will benefit from these uh, tests and uh, uh, these uh, patients should be referred for uh, electrophysiological tests the inherited retinal degeneration glaucoma patients with ocular sclerosis retinal detachment multiple sclerosis put the type inflammatory protein. ocular disease retinal ischemia diabetic vascular disease retinal vein and artery occlusion and endophthalmitis the list of tests is in case the patient fails to read the chart with no other abnormality visual behavior is normal in post traumatic and visual impairment and in visual impairment with stress what is the principle of electrophysiology it records the membrane resting potential and the changes that occurs after light stimulation there is a transmembrane movement of ions in retinal cells mainly sodium and potassium and it makes the cells hyperpolarized that's more negative to the extracellular space than in the dark in ecg actually since the heart is beating so we don't need any stimulation but uh, unlike that in erg the cells are at resting condition and requires light stimulation for the changes to happen at resting potential
for different abnormalities, we have a, uh, we have different tests. The EOG, electrooculogram, it uh, basically informs about the RPE resting potential. The pattern ERG, it tells us about the gross macular function. Scotopic ERG, about the gross rod function. Photopic ERG, gross cone function. Pattern VIP, uh, VEP, it uh, gives us information about macular ganglion cells. Flash VEP, about visual cortex. And multifocal ERG, it tells us about the macular photoreceptors. It's a localized response. If we have to do a number of tests, a series of tests, then how, how should we start? We start with the pattern ERG because uh, it's a binocular recording and uh, dilatation is not required for that. Then we dilate the patients fully and dark adapt the patient for about 30 minutes and do scotopic ERG. Then we have to light adapt the patient for about 15 minutes and then do photopic ERG. We get few waves in the ECG, ERG recording. The A wave is the negative component of that uh, pattern, which is originated, uh, which is uh, uh, originated from the photoreceptors. Then we have B wave. It's a positive deflection of the graph. It is, uh, it originates because of the bipolar cells and molar cells. Then C wave is a positive deflection following the B wave. And it tells us about the uh, RPE. It originates from the RPE. And we get some oscillatory potentials, which are positive wavelets on the B wave, and they originate from the amacrine cells. Uh, the full field electroretinogram is a mass electrical response of the retina to photic stimulation, photoreceptors of the inner plexiform layer. It measures the, uh, and pattern ERG measures the central retinal and ganglion cell functions. And stimulation is by reversing black and white checkerboard. It differentiates optic nerve and macular dysfunction. And it's recorded using DTL electrode. The uh, subsequent speaker uh, will be telling you about in details. The EOG checks the change in the electrical potential between the cornea and the ocular fundus, that is outer retina and RPE. It is recorded during successive periods of dark and light adaptation. The VEP, in VEP, the signal generated at visual cortex in response to visual stimulation. It assesses the integrity of the visual pathway and it reflects the activity of the central visual field. The multifocal ERG, it, uh, there is a simultaneous recording of focal retinal responses. It offers direct objective and topographical mapping. It records the central 30 to 40 degree of retinal function, and it's a cone-driven response. The fovea, parafovea, and near peripheral photo, uh, photopic retina function can be evaluated with multifocal ERG. The ERG is recorded by measuring the potential difference between electrodes, one of which is the active electrode, which may be a contact lens electrode, and a reference electrode is applied close to the eye near the canthus, and the ground electrode is applied to the forehead. Uh, this is a comprehensive chart that uh, uh, tells us about the refractive correction, visual equity, the need of refractive correction, visual equity, pupil size, and test distance and fixation uh, of different tests. In some of the tests, the refractive correction is a must, like multifocal ERG and uh, pattern VEP and pattern ERG, uh, we must correct the patient, uh, uh, give, give them the uh, uh, full correction. The visual equity is not important in uh, uh, FERG and multifocal ERG, it's very important. In EOG, visual equity is important. Pupil should be dilated in uh, full field ERG and uh, multifocal ERG. In uh, pattern VEP, it, it, uh, in undilated condition, it can be done. And similarly, the fixation also. It's very important in multifocal ERG, but in, uh, in flash ERG, it's not important. So this is a, a guideline uh, that, that gives a broad idea about uh, how to prepare and uh, what, what needs to be taken care of when we are putting a patient under any investigation. So uh, that's the introduction part, and uh, um, yes. I think the Thank next so uh, speaker will be uh, yes. giving the details about the specifics of the test. Thank, Thank you very much. I think everybody should gain a uh, very nice year before time. And uh, I just wanted to inform everyone that the Star Awards uh, Graham Holder uh, came to India, and Dr. Purna organized a very big workshop on electrophysiology. So naturally, the experience has been enriched. So this will be shared here today.
and uh, Dr. Rahul Prashad is talking on knowing the machine and electrodes. So welcome Dr. Rahul. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, uh, at the onset, I would like to thank the AIOS for giving us the opportunity, especially to Dr. Kashyap, who made me a part of this instruction course. Uh, sir has uh, just uh, uh, briefed us about the ERG and when and why to do ERG. My responsibility is uh, letting you understand a little about the machines and the electrodes. So to record an ERG, we must have an understanding of its basic technology and the clinical protocol associated with it. The basic technology involves electrodes, stimulation of the eye by the light, and the electronic recording devices. The clinical protocol involves how to prepare the patient, understanding the ICEF standard ERG, and the analysis in the reporting of the ERG. First, the electrodes. Now, for recording, we have three different types of electrode. Those are active <coughs> electrode, reference electrode, and the ground electrodes. The stability of the electrodes is maintained by a good connection as it decreases the impedance. Remember, if more the impedance would mean more noise, then that would lead to a wrong reading. Now, electrodes are kept clean to avoid infection and also for its reusability. Cleanliness also decreases the impedance. For good recording by an active electrode, one must use a non-irritating, non-energic, ionic, conductive, and a relatively non-viscous solution on the skin. Ensure good ocular contact to ensure proper electronic impedance. And although ICF standards are there, we should always define both normal values and a variability for our own laboratory. Now, recording by active electrodes uh, can be done by conductive fibers, foils, conjunctival loop electrodes. Then we have got contact lens electrodes, which are centrally transparent with an optical opening, and it just works like a lens specular. It gives the best recording, and even the recording is stable with the highest amplitude. Now, different types of active electrode include the skin electrode, which are mainly used in children. The corneal ERG electrode, they can be either monopolar or bipolar. The monopolar electrodes are the jet contact electrodes. The bipolar are the Burian electrodes. The DTL electrodes are most commonly used electrodes now. And then we have got the gold foil electrodes also. The reference electrodes are usually incorporated into the contact lens speculum assembly when you are using a bipolar electrode like the Burian electrode for stable configuration electrically. Electrodes can be, the reference electrode can be placed near the orbital rim or the ELO or the forehead. Then the third variety is the ground electrode, whereas, uh, which is actually kept at a separate skin electrode is attached to an indifferent point and connected to the ground. Typical location for, uh, uh, for using this uh, ground electrode are on the forehead or ear. Now, what is the electric, actual electrical impulse that is recorded? It is actually the difference of uh, recording between the active electrode and the reference electrode. The active electrode captures the action potential changes and the impedance, which is denoted by letter A. The reference electrode captures impedance only, that is the, uh, which is denoted by the letter R. Now, the difference between A minus R actually gives us the actual electrical impulse. Now coming to the specific types of electrode, first is the jet electrodes. These are disposable monopolar contact lens electrodes. The gold foil electrodes on polymethacrate with lead wire. There is an ease of insertion. The movement of lens during recording and absence of lead speculum contribute to the variability of the recording. There is a reduced possibility of eye infection, but the disadvantage is it has got gold plating which itches off with time. Then we have got the Burian LN electrodes. These are reusable contact lens electrodes with a built-in speculum and a lead wire. They are customizable to various sizes 
It is ideal for testing infants. The reference electrodes are built into the electrodes and they are in form for conductive coating of silver granules. The PMA shows variable degree of blurring, so they are not suitable when we, when we are recording ERG where the uh, image clarity is vital. It is usually used for full field ERG, but remember these electrodes are very costly. The DTL plus microconductive thread electrodes are those electrodes that are used most commonly. They are conductive thread, 50 microns float on the corneal film surface. It has a negligible mass, low cost and are disposable. The convenient to use and they give very clear images. There is no interference with the pupil or the optics. They give a very reliable ERG recording and they are well tolerated by children. Then we have got the gold foil electrodes. They are useful when you cannot use a contact lens electrode or when you don't want to anesthetize the cornea. The ERG amplitude will be substantially affected by this electrode. It requires an adapter. The reference in the ground electrode, a couple of points about it, especially about the color coding. The active electrodes, the wires are usually red in color. The reference is referred with blue and the ground is referred with black. The skin part is usually uh, cleaned uh, for the reference in the ground electrode by uh, skin gel such as a new prep uh, uh, skin prep gel. The cup of the electrodes are filled with gel and are attached for a better conductivity. We use 1020 conductive type of gel for this particular purpose. Then we have got adapters which are uh, channel, uh, one channel or two channel adapters. The one side of channel one has an active reference and a ground electrode attachment. The second channel, other side also has got an active and reference electrode attachment. When we have to test for an eye, we usually use one channel. And when we have to test for two eyes, we use the two channels. Now coming to machine at a glance, the machine as such has got three parts, the one, is the, uh, one is the monitor, the second is the CRT and the third is a GANS field board. The computer monitor tells us at what stage the investigations we are in, it guides us through the test and there are two types of stimulation that are present, the pattern stimulation and the flash stimulation that is taken care by the CRT and the GANS field board. Now this is a child view to show the electrodes placement. Now, electrodes with one eye is closed for a multifocal ERG patient. Now, there is a movable chin rest that has to be placed in front of the monitor. The patient has to be very adjusted to it. Then the chin rest with the monitor is fixed and the fixation point is noted and the test has started. Monitor displays the random pattern of a multifocal ERG. Then the chin rest is removed and the Gansfield ball is now in action. This is a closer view for baby flash which is used for Babies and unconscious fields. Now, this is one again, one again picture that shows a Gansfield ball, a closer view. The movable chin rest is attached to other place when the test is not being done. Now, this is a, a this is a schematic diagram that shows different electrodes put in different part when we are using different tests. For recording the ERG, the test procedure should be explained to the patient completely. Uh, for those tests that require pupil dilatation, the size of the pupil is recorded, the pupils are fully dilated, the patient is dark adapted in a dark room with an eye patch, the electrodes are attached with a dim red light in the room and then we start the test. We attach the electrode and follow the guidance coming on the computer screen. Safety information for both for machines and for the patients involved, first for the machine, the printer and an external USB hard drive should be connected via Wi-Fi and if disconnected, should never be tried to connect while doing the test. The automatic window updates should be deactivated. The dark room should be properly dark. Disconnect the power supply before any cleaning or repair. Should not be connected to, uh, via an extension code. Always use an external dive, uh, drive to have a regular backup. A password does help to protect the patient's data. Safety information for the patients. The electrode should not be attached to the damaged screen. The patient should be explained about the procedure and the way it should be disposed in the household waste. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rahul, for briefing about the machine and I am sure that everybody is now aware. So now let us talk on multifocal ERG and pattern ERG and the great expert on electrophysiology. Dr. Parveen Sin Madam is here. She has experience of 23 years in the Department of Electrophysiology in the most revered institute for retina that is Shankar Nitralaya. Uh, AIOC as well as Dr. Bharti who has been instrumental in bringing us uh, together and who has taken the initiative 
to set up this IC. Uh, this is something which doesn't interest a lot of people, but is quite useful. And thanks to my previous two speakers who have made my life much easier. The sequence definitely should have been fulfilled ERG before I did my talk, but uh, because of my prior engagements, I apologize for this uh, change in the sequence. So uh, talking of multifocal ERG, I will just first try to, you know, why do we need it? So as we know, full field ERG is a uh, full field or the full retina, global retinal response. So more than 50% of the cells have to be deranged. Then only you will get some changes in the full field ERG. So focal pathology gets missed out. So this focal pathology is very easily picked up on multifocal ERG. It was first developed by Sutter and uh, Tran. And it records, not only records focal responses, but it gives you a topographical map of these focal responses as well. If we look at how it differentiates it from a full field ERG, both the responses from rods and cones are given in full field ERG, but multifocal ERG, because it is uh, done in a in light adapted condition, it gives you responses only from the cones. Then it is a true electrical response, the full field ERG. But multifocal ERG is not a true response. It's a mathematical extraction. And in the subsequent slides, we will discuss how this happens. This is just the instrumentation which the previous speaker has covered. The important thing is the stimulus. The stimulus of multifocal ERG is very different from the full field ERG where we use single flashes. Here, it is an array of flashes or hexagons which is used. And this is the one which gives rise to uh, a different kind of a, uh, each hexagon gives you a, each a trace array or a single response. And then that gives you a topography of responses. Most importantly, because here the patient is looking at a pattern. So the fixation is very important. So if the patient is not fixating in the correct place, the whole stimulus goes out of uh, context because the stimulus Hexagons are made in such a way that the large hexagon is there for the, the, for the periphery and the smaller hexagons are there for the center. But if the patient is not fixating, then all this goes uh, wrong. Mathematical ex extraction goes wrong. So fixation is of ulti uh, utmost importance in multifocal ERG. Because fixation is important, you have to have refraction in place. And if you put refraction, you have to make sure that you don't have the rim effects. So this is the typical stimulus, it is cone driven, done in light adapted state, covers only central 40 to 50 degree of the retina and each hexagon has a 50% chance of being on and off at one particular period of time. Though it is called pseudo, that is why it is called pseudo random because it is not really random, it is a proper algorithm which is followed. And this is the kind of response that you get you get a trace array. Trace array means a small, small ERGs from each hexagon are given. And the topographical map means it gives you a distribution. But how is the reflex in the center? How is the reflex in the periphery? So you could, as you saw in the previous slide, you here in this side, you have a pointer here. This side, they had only 61 uh, responses. Then you had uh, 37, then you have 103. So the number of responses can be different. So what is the dif importance is that if you do uh, too many elements are checked, then the sig there is slow signal to noise ratio. So you get a good response, but then it takes a longer period of time. So the patient cooperation becomes questionable. And this is another way you can uh, average these responses from different quadrants, from different hemispheres, from different rings to give you this kind of topographical maps. It is also very important to know that topographical map look very nice to look at, but they take away the detail of the waveform, so they should not be really interpreted in isolation. If you talk of origin, just like the A wave of full field ERG, this uh, N1 from the multifocal ERG has an origin from the photoreceptors and the off bipolar cells. And this also comes largely from the on and off bipolar cells with very little contribution from the photoreceptors. So this is something which if you really go into detail, the main thing to remember is it does not only depend upon whether the flash, given flash was bright or dark. It also depends whether the previous flash was bright or dark. That will affect the stimulation. So this is what is called kernel responses. So that, 
as in the fulfilled DRG, if you look at amplitude, you see whether there is cell death, where the number of cells are decreasing, means the amplitude will decrease. If the cells are numbers the same, but they are not functioning properly, means latency will increase. So the distribution, you can see here, central area is gone, means more likely to be a macular dystrophy. The whole periphery is gone, only central area is preserved to some extent, more likely to be RP. There is a generalized reduction, means here both the central and the peripheral cells are affected. Localized means here the lower area is more affected than the superior, so it gives you the distribution in the way the disease is affecting the retina. So artifacts should be kept in mind. So this looks nice, this is normal. You may think that this is also some responses are there. Actually when you see this kind of tri uh, peaked responses, this is largely electrical response and you should look whether any electrical noise is there interfering your ERG. Here you can see that periphery the responses are better than in the center. That is usually cannot happen. Mostly this is a eccentric fixation. Patient is not fixating properly. Positional artifact when the Stimulus, the patient and the glasses are not in proper alignment, you may have some kind of positional artifacts. Just coming to clinical application, you can see both sides, the retina looks similar, fulfilled ERG is almost similar on both sides, but multifocal ERG gives you the diagnosis. Generalized reduction, more likely to be a cone rod dystrophy, only central area gone, more likely to be a macular dystrophy. So uh, this is again uh, gives you how much function is remaining in cases of retinitis pigmentosa. For central serous uh, chorioretinopathy, we know now because fulfilled DRG is showing a generalized dysfunction that it is not a macular dystrophy and now uh, newer imaging techniques has also shown us the same. Most important diagnostic criteria where uh, multifocal ERG is used is hydroxychloroquine chloroquine toxicity. You can see that Fulfilled ERG will remain normal throughout the period and the patient will continue to lose vision. So small area of dysfunction, this is very sensitive test for hydroxychloroquine toxicity. This is an example of chloroquine toxicity. This is, dis uh, why do we do hydroxychloroquine toxicity so important? That it has now got in included <coughs> in the screening test for hydroxychloroquine to toxicity. And the important thing to remember is that uh, these are the two tests which are of utmost importance, multifocal ERG, FAF and SDOCT. And this is the criteria which you need to remember. Any patient who's you've been using more than 5 milligram per kg body weight uh, for more than 5 years definitely should do uh, multifocal ERG on a regular basis. In fact, it is encouraged that the patient does it at the baseline also because sometimes the associated disease itself may affect the retina. Desferoximin toxicity, this is something which we had published very early on once we started doing multifocal ERG. In acquired diseases like diabetic retinopathy, you may think that we only need OCT, OCTA, but one of the most sensitive tests for diabetic retinopathy is actually electrophysiology. Even before obvious changes develop on the retina, you can have full field ERG which is down and multifocal ERG can have changes or reduce amplitudes in specific areas of cotton wool spots or rodent blot hemorrhages. You can see uh, even in patients without DR, you can see how the multifocal ERG is already disturbed, increased latency, low amplitudes are seen, even in the absence of any structural changes. You can again, same example, that even patients without DR, multifocal ERG can be down. Few things to remember, whenever you do a multifocal ERG test, it does not replace full field ERG. Multifocal ERG should never be done in isolation. Definitely first do a full field ERG to know whether full field ERG is normal or not. Then only it makes sense to do a distribution which area it is more affected and which area it is less affected. And multifocal ERG topography distribution of array is more important than absolute. So don't go by the colorful maps. Look into the each waveform at a specific area. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, madam. You I have think I've already crossed yeah, the lines. No, 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 no. You are on time. And thank you so much for being part and for uh, sharing your deep knowledge. So uh, now I am going to talk on tips on EOG because I have to go to some other hall. After that, Dr. Purna will talk. And then after that, Dr. Nidhi will, will talk you on uh, VEP and Dr. Purna will uh, wind up the session. <coughs>
Okay, good morning everyone and thank you AIOS for giving us this opportunity to conduct this <coughs> instruction course on behalf of JAS. <coughs> I'm talking on electroaculogram tips. So who is credited with the first description of the EOG? The EOG was first described by Elwin Mark and clinical applications were described first by Geoffrey Arden. So the principle... Huh? Our IC is still 1025. You can take as much uh, uh, knowledge from Dr. Purna and Dr. Rahul, Dr. Nidhi, Dr. Vibhuti Bhushan, as much as you can. So physiology uh, behind EOG is that uh, during the 15 minutes period of dark adaptation, there is a fall in the recorded standing potential, typically reaching a minimum at 10 minutes, and this is referred to as the dark trough. And uh, following light onset, there's an increase in the transpithelial potential of RP producing the light rise. The light rise is ultimately the result of increase in intracellular uh, free calcium, which is released from the endoplasmic reticulum, regulated by an interaction between ER bestotrophin and L type of calcium channels, associated with basolateral membrane. The intracellular calcium gates the opening of a basolateral uh, calcium dependent chloride channel, increased chloride conductance depolarizes the basolateral membrane, which increases the transepithelial potential recorded as increase in the standing potential of the eye. So what are the prerequisite and instructions? The prerequisite is dilated pupil, pre-test 20 minutes, normal room light adaptation, full extraocular muscle motility, good visual acuity, refraction correction is not needed, impedance should be less than 5 kilo ohm. The head position should be stable, eye movement only in horizontal direction, never anticipate and move prior, increase illumination in case of the non-dilating uh, uh, pupil and avoid any bright light procedure before EOG. So stimulator is the Ganfield uh, dome, how it is performed. The two LED lights are 15 degree left and right of the central light and uh, it is bright during light adaptation and minimum brightness is maintained in the dark. The pupil should be dilated before testing and after suitable skin preparation, recording electrodes should be placed close to the canthi of the HI. For the dark phase, total darkness should be maintained for 15 minutes except for the dim fixation light. For the light phase, a gauge field background light of 100 photopic cardilla square meter should be turned on and continue the recording for 10 seconds out of every minute in each phase. Active, you can see the active and reference electrode, inner and outer canthi, ground electrode, forehead, and impedance should be less than 5 kilo ohm. You can see here gold cup electrodes, black is the ground, blue is the reference, and red is the active electrode. The patient has to move his eyes to LED with single sweep with head fixed. Sackets recorded 10 to 15 seconds per minute, 40 to 45 to 50 seconds rest. Measure 15 minutes in dark and 15 minutes in light. Ardent ratio is the maximum amplitude in dark adap light adaptation and mi maximum minimum amplitude in the dark adaptation. LP by DT is into 100 is more than 180. If it is less than uh, uh, 1.65, it is abnormally low. So parameters, what are the parameters which should be included in the EOG report? LP by DT ratio, DT amplitude in microvolt, implicit time, time from the start of the light phase to the light peak, type of adapting light source, pupil size, and note on any difficulties encountered during testing which may affect the confidence in results such as inconsistent eye movement. So uh, the reliable EOG is the square regularly pay, uh, placed waveforms. Waves are not that proper, that means either patient is not fixating properly or electrode is moving. Light and dark values taken in respective adaptation period. Typically 12 minutes for dark trough and 25 to 26 minutes for light peak. Background illumination is 100 candela per square meter. So the, the normal light rise in EOG requires a normal RPE and good photoreceptor function. As the light rise depends on the photoreceptor function also, the patient with abnormal rod function will have a corresponding decrease in the light rise, thus mirroring the extent of rod photoreceptor damage. If ERG is absolutely negative, the EOG can, will be absolutely negative too. Some photoreceptor action is a must to have an EOG reading, so we recommend always to do ERG and EOG together and not in a singular form. I mean, in case of good rod function in ERG, a reduction in the light rise in EOG is suggestive for abnormalities localized to RPE, that is the best disease. Now, I'm sharing a few clinical tips. 
The most common use of the EOG is to confirm vitelli form macular dystrophy, patient with best disease and some patients with adult vitelli form dystrophy, where we have normal ERG but abnormal EOG. You can see here the uh, uh, LP by DT is 1.33. So in bestrophin gene mutated dystrophies, if you see in all EOG is reduced only in adult onset vitelli form macular dystrophy, it is normal. And if you see ERG, ERG is normal in all bestrophin gene mut mutated dystrophies, only severely reduced in autosomal dominant vitreoretinochoroidopathy. Now, EOG is abnormal irrespective of the stage of best vitelli form dystrophy. If it is a case of unilateral clinical best dystrophy, having sub but then it will have some optimal order ratio in both the eyes. And if EOG in a child with suspected base disease is difficult to perform, test both the parents. As one carrier parent will surely exhibit abnormal EOG. So test the parents. And uh, there is a debatable role in differential diagnosis of congenital stationary night blindness. EOG is actually uh, useful in differentiating CSNB, uh, in which it is normal from other progressive uh, cause progressive uh, disorders causing night blindness. It was also abnormal in photoreceptor layer disorders, Stargas disease, retinitis pigmentosa, cone dystrophy and cone rod dystrophy. What is fast oscillation EOG? In 2017, the ICEM standards for clinical EOG included fast oscillation EOG officially. The advantage of fast oscillations is that the test time is shorter making it easier for the patients to be tested. The slow oscillation is recorded over 15 minutes of dark adaptation followed by 15 minutes of light adaptation. On the other hand, the fast oscillation has the advantage of greater compliance because of the total inspection time is only 15 minutes. Fast oscillation is different from typical EOG which is dependent on the calcium gated chloride channel. These are sinusoidal, they are not typically square. And the alteration takes place in one minute interval in fast oscillation pattern of waveform and mechanism is also different from typical square. It is happening at the apex of the RPE, not at the base of RPE and the fall in subretinal potassium reduces the movement of chloride into the RPE. The resulting hyperchlorization is responsible for the light trough, not the peak and followed by dark peak, not the dark trough during recovery and here apex is having different potential changes. So, role in distinguishing whether CSC is the acute or chronic type by, by evaluating RPE function as patients sometimes don't know the exact duration of the disease. In chronic CSC, decreasing RPE function is confirmed by decrease in the amplitude of the light trough. Remember, light trough, not the light peak of fast oscillation EOG. The, these parameters can be used as indicators for detecting the severity of macular functional disturbance and predicting the visual outcome for this entity. Thank you so much. I hope you are in, uh, now aware of EOG and practical applications. Thank you. So now I invite Dr. Purna. He will be talking on full field ERG, which is very, very important. So good morning everyone. So at the outset, I would like to thank All India Ophthalmologist Society and also Bharti ma'am for including me in this uh, instruction course. So as Parin ma'am was telling like ERG something everyone feels uh, they try to including me as a resident was not, I was scared of those waveforms. So that's the last thing we used to study. And some of us, we, even my PG sometimes they think this is something recent advances we have to read. This is not something recent advance. This, Technology existed, I mean, maybe more than 50 years ago when Jeff Harden was the head of the Moore Fields, very uh, set up the department and all. And even if you read this diabetic retinopathy related paper, some of the very old articles from 1968 and all, they have reference for full field ERGs. So I'll be talking about full field ERG. So Vibhuti has already briefed, so making my job easy. 
So I'll just uh, briefly go through the basics of fulfilled DRG followed by a case example which is more practical. You all should know when to order, what to look for, all that. So ERG is a mass response of the retina to aluminum stimulus. You stimulate the retina with light. There will be biochemical and ionic changes which happens in the photoreceptor and RPE which generates electrical potential which is recorded as ERG. It's as simple as that. Just stimulate the retina so and just record it. So just like we have multiple waveforms in ECG like PQRS, we have A, B and oscillatory potential. So as already told, photoreceptor basically originates from the outer retina that is photoreceptors. B wave is from the bipolar cells and the molar cells, basically middle and the inner retina. And oscillatory potentials are from the amacrine cells. These are seen as deviations along the ascending limb of B wave. So basically, this is important for the anatomical localization. Which part of the retina is affected, whether outer retina or inner retina? If the photoreceptor, which part of the photoreceptors is affected? So, just to brief to understand the difference between different types of ERG, full field ERG, we are getting response from the entire retina. So, in pattern, it's mainly from the posterior pole, that's predominantly macula, and multifocal ERG, we are testing each and every point on the macula. This is how a typical full field ERG printout looks like. We have a very recent diagnosis machine at our institute. This is how printout looks. The printout, the pattern may look in different machines, may look different in different machines, but the waveforms will be similar. So whatever that is uh, uh, they seen in uh, blue color represents the normal, the black waveform, the one in the black color represents the patient. So that is something very important. So whenever you invest a, on an ERG machine, so first thing you should collect your own normative data. That's the most important thing. So the, some uh, companies, they do give normative data, but most of it is Western data. So always uh, suggest collect your own normative data and uh, from the same machine on which you are going to do and average it, the company people can average it and give it to you. So then start doing the ERGs. So that is preferred. So first, we are, when you do an ERG, we start with the dark adapted responses. We dark adapt the patient for minimum 20 minutes. After 20 minutes of dark adaptation, it has to be pitch dark adaptation. The, literally, in, in between the 20 minutes, in case if the patient gets exposed to the little light, that has to be repeated again. So by doing this, basically we are silencing the cones in the entire retina. In that state, if you stimulate the retina with 0 0.01 candela centimeter square of light, so what we get is mainly the rod driven response. I'm using the word rod driven response. So because you may ask, sir, you are, there is only B waves in, there is no A wave because rod response is for A, rod is a photoreceptor. So this is just represents the rod activity because the depolarization which happens in rods at such a low uh, intensity of stimulus, it's very low to be recorded by an electrodes. So only the, if the bipolar cells are intact, then only we see the B waves. So that's indirectly it's indicating the rods are intact. For example, if you have a condition where rod photoreceptor is normal, where something problem in the bipolar cells, so then also you'll get abnormal dark up to 0 0.01 years. You should not wrongly interpret that as a rod dysfunction. This is something very important. So once we increase in the same dark adapted state, once we increase the st intensity of stimulus, the A wave starts appearing and the cones will also start contributing. This is what we call as combined response, the response from both cones and the rods. So after that, we light out of the patient for minimum 10 minutes ambient light. In that uh, state, if you stimulate the retina, with uh, 3 candela per centimeter square of light, what we get is a predominant cone driven response. I am using the word predominant cone driven response. In the stray, same state, if you stimulate the retina with 30 hertz flicker, the response what we get is only from the cones. Predominant and only, there is a difference. So the reason being at such high frequency, rods can't respond at all. So whatever the response you are getting is only cone driven. So whenever you look at an ERG printout, this is all you need to know it's simple just look at whether rod component is more affected whether cone component is more affected or both are affected okay and look for any presence of any other negative waveforms so i'll just show with case example what exactly a negative waveforms means so clear fine so i'll go to go through some of the case scenarios where there is uncertainty about what's happening intended and required so let's start with the night vision problems first so this was a 26 year old male who presented with night vision problem. 
fundus clinically appeared absolutely normal and OCT also appeared normal. This case was referred to me. These are the kind of cases which I get where clinically they are not able to explain anything. Obviously, they were labeling him as malingering. So, I thought of when we don't understand anything, we, next thing what we do is electrophysiological test. We did ERG in this patient. Just look at the dark adapt response. The line is almost flat. It's See my cursor, yes, here it is. So, compared to the normal, the dark graph 0 0.01 is unrecordable. That means there is a severe <coughs> rod dysfunction. We don't know the cause yet. And also, there is a cone compound, light adapt response are also affected. The amplitude is reduced and the latency is slightly delayed. But 26 year old male, the fundus looks normal, OCT is normal. Why is this? There is definitely no problem. Now, patient is not malingering, that's for sure. So in these kind of things, what first thing we should think of a vitamin A deficiency, <coughs> where uh, think the structurally the retina can appear normal. We did the serum level, it uh, came out very low, 0 0.02. <coughs> Again, our job doesn't stop at that level. We should find out why should a 26 year old male should have a vitamin A deficiency. That should be our next question. We should work it off for the any malabsorption syndrome. So this patient on general physical examination, Again, this is very important as ophthalmologist retina, we always think of eye. When the patient walks in, we should always pay attention to the overall build, how the general condition. He looked malnourished. He had, when I asked some leading question, he had history of dyspepsia, loose tools and all. He underwent extensive workup. <coughs> Finally, intestinal biopsy has to be done, which confirmed intestinal lipophoskinosis. Sorry for that. The ERG was repeated after one week, one month, and two months of receiving vitamin A intramuscular injections. You can see this is just one week after intramuscular, B wave is almost getting normalized. Two months later, ERG is almost normal. If not for this test, simple test, the patient would have been this thing, and also it would have been life threatening because he had like intestinal lipophoskinosis. And now it's completely normal. <coughs> Let's look at an example where the patient is asymptomatic but retina is looking abnormal. So this was a 20 year old, old male, came for a routine checkup with 6'6 vision. He had multiple flex like lesion throughout the fundus. OCT was normal. We did ERG, ERG was also normal. So what is this? So this is a case of benign flecked retina. Okay, so this will be functional, structurally it may look abnormal, but functionally this will be normal. These patients don't need any intervention, just a follow-up, that's all. So one more patient, 36 year old, again history of night vision problem. This patient also had multiple flex like <coughs> white telephone like deposit throughout the fundus. OCT is normal. Just look at the ERG. So dark red responses are completely, uh, almost like a <coughs> it's unrecordable undetectable that's the better word to use that's what my mentors professor graham holder says use the word undetectable so darker combined response if you see the a wave is forming b wave instead of going like this it is getting terminated here itself it's not even reaching the baseline so this is what we call it as typical electronegative erg so this is a <laughs> electronegative erg <coughs> we get in whatever the condition which affects inner retina in csnbs and all there will be conduction whatever that basically it has to affect b wave is from bipolar cells something which affect bipolar cells you will have a electronegative erg for example crao patient of CRA, if you do erg outer retinal circulation is intact inner retina is gone you get electronegative same thing in ischemic crvo outer retina is intact inner retina is that's what we call it as no no ischemic non ischemic crvo differential you must have read reverse day by B ratio, this is what they mean. So this was a case of fundus albipunctatus, which is a form of CSNB. <coughs> Just look at the so two different scenarios what I showed. One looked grossly abnormal, one looks minimally abnormal on clinical examination, but ERG is telling totally a different story. So this is what we believe some of us who practice ERG, whatever that appears structurally, just don't believe it. The functionally it could be behaving entirely in a different way. I'll just end after this case example. This was a, 20, a normal looking retina with unexplained visual loss. 26 year old may, female recently married brought by husband because she was quite inattentive to the surroundings. 
the she was giving variable responses when we checked the uh, this thing basically she was not ready to accept that i have some problem so she was uh, putting all the blame on husband simply is blaming me that i have eye problem i don't have any problem something like that we did oct i'm showing all the cross sections of oct absolutely normal fundus heart of fluorescence is normal again diagnosis obviously we thought recently married maybe she's not happy so malingering but uh, you should not label any patient as malingering without subjecting them for an electrophysiological test so that is what we did just look at her dark color responses are completely normal so this row but look at the light adapter responses it is unrecordable so this is a typical case of achromatopsia so which is a form of stationary cone dystrophy these are the kind of cavitations what we get in oct of achromatopsia but this patient did not have enough that defect <coughs> for the want of time i'll just skip the next uh, case because i already caused you have you have oh thank you so much sir. so there is one more uh, this is the one more uh, scenarios what we get they have taken multiple opinions they will be shifting one physician to another physician but they don't know what's wrong with their retina this was one such case so 25 year old male with night vision problem no positive family history vision was 69 anterior segment color vision everything was normal so he was born out of a consanguineous marriage so this is how the fundus looked the moment i saw the fundus i was excited okay this is mizu phenomena this is uh, csnb this is how a classical mizu phenomena looks when if you people have seen those uh, patients with csnb and uh, uh, golden flower syndromes and all that so then this is the autofluorescence more or less normal except for a minor changes here and there so oct showed uh, some sciatic changes oh now i revised oh maybe this is not csnb because usually most of the csnbs will have a normal octs and this has uh, this thing i thought maybe okay now i maybe i'm dealing a case with uh, i'm dealing with the case of juvenile retinoschisis so that was my diagnosis but anyway we subjected them him for the erg so erg was not in favor of uh, juvenile i was expecting a electronegative erg in fact when my uh, the uh, technician came brought this report to me i was very sure i'll give the report i'll just see i'll just sign but when i saw the report i was surprised there is no electronegative waveform the oct was very classic of uh, retinoschisis so so what to do them in these scenarios you need to do some tests which are beyond the icf standards <coughs> this is what we did we stimulated the long and medium wavelength cone and short wavelength cone separately look at the l and m cone responses it is unrecordable look at the response for short wavelength stimulus it is an exaggerated response so this turned out to be a case of enhanced s cone syndrome so to conclude electrophysiology is an important tool to aid in various diagnoses second point is very important it should always be followed by a clinical correlation you should never take any of the imaging or investigative modality in isolation and additional genetic information in some cases adds strength to our correlation thank you so much vp a very good morning to all of you uh, thank you dr bharti ma'am for including me in this icc it's changing on its own so i will be talking about i'll be talking about visual evoke potentials so the electrical signals which are generated at the visual cortex in response to visual stimulation are occipital responses uh, which correspond to the central visual field and they help in assessing the intracranial visual pathways and their functional integrity right from the retina to the optic nerves to the optic chiasma optic radiation and the occipital cortex the peripheral retinal projections are within the calcarine fissure while the central retinal projections are along the occipital lobe 
the foveal projection is magnified at the cortex where m is the linear extent of cortex in millimeter at the fovea is around 5.6 millimeters per degree and 10 degrees away from the fovea it reduces to 1.5 millimeters per degree so the indications for VP will be optic neuritis, multiple sclerosis, optic atrophy, evaluation of hereditary optic neuropathies, toxic neuropathies, traumatic brain injury, compressive optic neuropathies, glaucoma and amblyopia. Also we need to do it in cases uh, who have unexplained visual loss, malingering, pre-surgical evaluation and measuring of visual acuity in non-responsive subjects. So the requirements here, we have the similar type of electrodes, active reference and ground, where the impedance should be less than 5 kilo ohm and the impedance difference between the active and reference electrode should be less than 20%. The placement of the electrodes follows the 10-20 rule in which the uh, top of the head is divided from the nasion to the inion in different parts and the ground electrode is placed uh, over the top of the scalp there is the reference electrode and there is the active electrode. This is how the machine output will show if there is a, uh, the impedance of the any of the electrode is nearing 5. So we need to reattach the electrode. The stimulus used for VP can be flash, pattern, color or motion. Uh, for flash VP the GANS field stimulator is used and in pattern VP the CRT monitor is used. Now looking at pattern VP is most commonly done uh, for patients having good visual acuity in a light adapted state at 1 meter with correction in undilated conditions monocularly. Here the requirement is a checkerboard pattern. Uh, here the pattern is reversed. We have different check sizes of 60 minutes and 15 minutes. The luminance is constant 40 to 60 candela per meter square and the contrast is high. Flash VP indications would be same but here are done in patients who have poor visual acuity, light adapted and the room is dimly illuminated done monocularly. Here the field size is more than 20 degree and we have to give at least one flash per second that is one hertz frequency. Flash intensity is 1.5 to 3 candela per meter square with a low background intensity of 15 to 30 candela per meter square. The pattern onset and offset VP here the pattern is flashed on and then off. So uh, pattern will be done for investigation of optic neuropathies. Flash VP to be done uh, for patients having poorer optics, poor cooperation, poor vision and where pattern reversal cannot be done. Onset and offset VP uh, will be done in cases of nystagmus, malingering and amblyopia. Coming to pattern VP, uh, as I earlier said, this is the checkerboard stimuli where the pattern is reversed. Here we need to reduce artifacts uh, like blinking of eye, the lesser the better. The number of tests done per test at least should be 64 and these tests are repeated twice. In, in infants or uncooperative patients, the numbers per test can be reduced. Now checks which subtend an uh, arc of 15 minutes are the best stimuli for testing foveal vision and larger checks of 60 minutes are superior in evaluating parafoveal function. So when we are using more than one check size, this increases the diagnostic yield. If the resulting VP using the 60 minute check or the larger check is poorly formed, then we need to retest it using a larger check size or use a pattern onset stimulus. So this is how a waveform would look. Here we have few positive and negative waves in which P100 is important. Its latency normally is 90 to 110 milliseconds and this can be standardized lab uh, according to the lab and its amplitude is important uh, which is more than 5 microvolts in normal cases. So this is how the output will look for both the eyes and done twice for diff different check sizes. This is a no normal waveform where you can see that the latency and amplitude in both the eyes is comparable. Coming to tra traumatic optic neuropathy where the left eye was involved. Here if you see as compared to the right eye, uh, there is a delayed implicit time and reduced amplitude as well. In cases of AION, uh, again uh, if you see the implicit time might be normal but the amplitude is reduced and the waveform becomes a little wider. Similarly, in cases of papillitis, uh, implicit time might be delayed and amplitude might be moderately reduced. 
This is a case of optic atrophy with no PL, disc was pale and uh, it is a flat VP, no signal was emitted. Now VP can also be used for evaluation in cases of neurofibromatosis having optic nerve gliomas and their progression. So over, over a period of time uh, it can be seen that if the glioma is uh, increasing in size there might be some uh, increase in the latency in the optic uh, uh, in the VP. Similarly in toxic uh, neuropathies uh, it can be shown that the P100 uh, shows slower peak times. Other cases, uh, for example, meningeal tuberculosis, uh, prolonged uh, latency might be seen. Coming to pattern onset and offset, here the pattern is flashed on and then off for double the time of an equiluminant diffuse background. Here also different check sizes are uh, there. Now this produces a more robust VP than does pattern reversal in the central 30 degrees. So this is the difference in pattern onset and offset. It is on and then there is an equilumulant uh, background and in pattern reversal uh, the check colors are reversed. So pattern reversal normally exacerbates nystagmus and interferes with the ability of the eye to maintain foveal fixation. So uh, pattern onset offset is good for detection of visual acuity in subjects with nystagmus, for monitoring amblyopia and in cases of malingering. These are the waveforms. Here the C2 wave is important. Its normal latency is 100 to 120 millisecond. Now flash VP uh, as earlier told uh, it is done for uncooperative patients having media opacities to prognosticate the eyes with poor vision before planning surgery and to monitor the visual function of babies. Now VP is often prognostic in delayed maturation of the visual systems. Usually the infant with delayed maturation will have a normal flash VP while permanently cortical blind infants may have abnormal VPs. So this is how the output will look. Here a little alteration of the wave peak and troughs can be done to get a proper waveform which can be then calculated by the machine. Uh, in flash VP, the P2 wave is important, its latency is 100 to 120 milliseconds and the N2 P2 amplitude should be more than 10 microvolts. And this is how the output will look. Just a small note on sweep VP uh, done in infants, suspected malingers or disabled subjects. Here the visual acuity can be extrapolated from the VP and calculated in logmar units. Multifocal VP uh, has come up recently here. This is an objective assessment of uh, visual field or objective perimetry. Uh, it can be done in cases with glaucoma and chiasmal misrouting uh, like in albinism. Here there is a bracket with four active electrodes and a ground electrodes, electrode and uh, the output comes very similar to the multifocal ERG. It can be in a sectoral form or it can be in a ring form. This is how a normal multifocal VP will look for both the eyes. In cases of optic neuritis, uh, uh, it can be seen that in one eye, the central 30 degrees was abnormal and after two months uh, on testing, there was significant recovery in the amplitude but slower peak time persisted due to demyelination. Just a recap of the major waveforms that need to be seen in VEP. Thank you for your patient here. Thank you, Dr. Nidhi, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, so with that, uh, we come to the end of uh, this uh, remarks and uh, some few, few tips for the audience. No, same thing like whatever I told like uh, before we plan to invest on this machine we should be very clear why are we buying this already told and the second thing is the which company you buy so that is also important uh, the reason being the ERG being very sensitive machine it requires a constant servicing they have to be in constant touch <coughs> see because very very minor change can give you waves which are very erratic they may look like a recording but they may not be recording and the third thing is how you set up the room. So it has to be dark, the grounding condition has to be good. In our, uh, when we started ERG in 2007, the, the grounding condition, it took almost three years for it to stabilize. 
we were repeatedly getting some noise from where and some electrical work used to happen and all that so make sure you have such uh, facilities and the patient whenever you either do erg or when you order for an erg explain the patient what they can expect out of it so they should be clear because most of the time some there could not be a treatment even after doing the erg that patient should be you known in indian scenario it so happens they are paying for it once the report comes they expect some form of treatment so that is something very important before subjecting because it's a very long test not like an OCT P scan which is takes maybe maximum 5 minutes it takes like 2 3 hours that has to be explained and the kind of preparation what they have to undergo like they should not wash hair with shampoo because that can cause some electrical uh, uh, interference so this instructions have to be given whenever we send the patient so that's very important because patient's expectations should match for what we are ordering so that is something so on erg i can go on talking <laughs> there's no end to it but uh, it's good to see that interest being and thanks to uh, sirs and all that they are taking these initiatives to sensitize the audience about the importance of electrophysiology this will stay forever so whatever the technology that may come imaging and all it cannot replace erg because this is the only this is the highest level of test what we can do in ophthalmology so erg can never lie so because it's giving the the functional aspect of the tissues. So thank you, sir. Actually, we all of us know that electrophysiology is there and uh, these tests can be done. But most often in our day to day routine practice, we forget to actually identify the patients who can benefit from these tests. So that is something that we need to keep in mind. And uh, uh, if the facility is there or in the referral centers, wherever it is, we must uh, advise the patients to undergo those tests if needed because they can benefit really uh, it can be a life changing uh, uh, diagnostic uh, uh, tool for them and uh, it can give them a guideline for rest of their lives so uh, thank you very much thank you uh, uh, for your patience and uh, with that we come to the end of this session thank you